As you can probably tell from the snow falling around me in my backdrop, there wasn't enough money in the budget to visit Egypt this week, guys. Sorry about that, what can I do? Covering 13 acres at 230 meters in length, 146 meters tall, made up of 2.3 million stone blocks, on average weighing 2.5 tons, the Great Pyramid of Giza is, bar none, the greatest single achievement of the Bronze Age. And that's really saying something. Myself and 10 other YouTubers have come up with this big collab. They're all talking about the wonders of the Bronze Age. You can check it out in the pinned comment below. It's fantastic. But despite the scale of the Great Pyramid, in this video, I want to show you using the latest archeological evidence. All the sources are in the description as always. I want to show you guys how the Egyptians might have built it. The first step would be to select a site and there were three main criteria. The first, the land had to be as flat as possible. The second is that you had to have a quick access to the raw material, the raw limestone that would make up the bulk of the inner core. The fancy outer limestone and the granite could all be imported, but you don't want to drag the majority of the material a long way. And thirdly and finally, you wanted to have access to a river, the Nile of course, to import all the goods that you couldn't source on site. The Giza Plateau is of course perfect for that. As the name suggests, it is a plateau. It is flat land. There is a suitable quarry a mere 320 meters away from the pyramid. And the Nile, when flooded, it would come right up to the banks of the pyramid. It doesn't do that now though, since the construction of the dam at Aswan. As every good conspiracy theorist worth his salt knows, the pyramid is aligned to true north. Here's one way the Egyptians may have done that. Place a stick upright in the ground. A couple of hours before midday, measure the shadow it casts. Use the tip of that shadow to draw a circle around the stick. After midday, measure the shadow again when it reaches the circle. As the sun sets in equal and opposite directions, the halfway point between these two shadows is true north. To extend this point north, the Egyptians could have stretched a cord using that line until it started to sag, at which point they could have taken another measurement. This would have been most accurate during the solstice. The cord stretching ceremony is well documented in Egyptian culture. They used it to plan temples and measure fields for taxes. Documents describing this ceremony also make reference to the shadow or stride of Re. It wouldn't have been pinpoint accurate, but neither is the Great Pyramid. It's about 40 centimeters off, but over a length of 230 meters, that's still really good going. Very impressive stuff. 90 meters to the north on the Giza Plateau, a series of trenches were cut into the bedrock. These line up almost exactly to the interior passages of the Giza Pyramid. This could have been a potential first location for the pyramid, but it also could have been a test run somewhere the architects could build the interior chambers and test out what they would look like and all of the angles and measurements and those sorts of things. As for leveling the site, the Egyptians did not level the entire 13 acres. That would have been an enormous task. They just leveled a ring around the edge of the pyramid, around the foundation. And as far as the tools they used to do that, we're not quite sure. We're not sure what they used to level the measurements for 230 meters. So blowy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst, <laughs> worst location for a film on Egypt ever. <laughs> the majority of the limestone was excavated using dolerite hammers. This would have been a laborious task if ever there was one. Some were hafted, most were not but they were not required to be very precise cuts. If you look at the interior stones, they're very roughly cut. Any gaps are filled with mortar and small stones. But the real question is, how did they cut the granite that was used for the sarcophagus and the interior passages? We don't have any Egyptian tools surviving that suggest how they did that, but we do have the tool marks that they left suggesting they used saws and drills. Experimental archeology span has shown that bronze and copper saws can cut perfectly well through granite, 
However, they would lose one millimeter of edge for every three millimeters of granite cut. This means that they would have had to have been replaced very frequently and it would have been quite an expensive task, but this was an expense the Egyptians were used to paying. They had been making stuff out of granite and hard stone, particularly vases, since before even the Old Kingdom for several centuries by the time the Great Pyramid was built. Archaeologists have long debated how the Egyptians moved these stones over the sand. Well, it seems the answer comes from an inscription in a tomb of a Middle Kingdom pharaoh called Jehuti Hotep. The inscription of his tomb shows a 170 man two team pulling a statue on a sledge, not rollers, crucially. But even more crucially, are images of people pouring water in front of the sledge. It was originally believed that this was just part of some ritual. However, researchers at the University of Amsterdam have demonstrated that wet sand requires 50% less effort to drag stone across than dry sand. So even if it did have some sort of ritual purpose, the Egyptians can't have ignored the uh, practical reasons for pouring water in front of their sledges. As for moving stone over water, this would not have been a huge task for the Egyptians. They were very accomplished shipbuilders, and their whole life revolved around the Nile. The exact location of the harbor around Giza is unknown though, but it may be buried underneath a modern shopping center, frustratingly. When that was being built, they uncovered a 65 meter long wall, four meters wide. It went as deep as the watershed. This may very well be the container wall of Khufu's harbor, but until we excavate that site further or blow up the shopping center, uh, we might not get an answer to that. In 2013 though, archaeologists made an absolutely incredible discovery, a papyrus detailing the routine and schedule of a team of people led by a man called Merer, who delivered the fancy limestone from the east of the Nile over to the Giza pyramid. Here's an extract from it. Day 27, sail from the Lake of Khufu, navigation towards the horizon of Khufu, loaded with stones, spend the night in the horizon of Khufu. Day 28, sail from the horizon of Khufu in the morning, sailing up the river to Tara south. Day 29, Inspector Marais spends the day with his team to gather stones in Tara south, spend the night at Tara south. What's fascinating about that is, not only does it give us that glimpse into the schedule of the Egyptians, but we can also find out the name of the Great Pyramid. They called it the Horizon of Khufu. Fancy, fancy stuff. I love it. Now, one of the most controversial aspects of building the pyramid is what shape and form were the ramps used to raise the stone blocks. Well, surviving ramps on mastabas and smaller pyramids show that it was just a straight ramp up. However, we don't have any surviving ramps on larger pyramids, so it's still up for debate. What is interesting though, is that from the edge of the quarry, 320 meters away from the pyramid, a ramp of just six degrees would have lifted the stones 30 meters up inside the pyramid. As the pyramid is obviously much, much wider at the base, this small six degree ramp would have been able to move 40 to 50% of the material involved in building the pyramid. So they really could get the majority of the work done with a very shallow ramp. In 2018, just last year, another ramp was excavated, this time at a quarry called Hatnub. We know from inscriptions that it was dated to the time of Khufu, maybe even earlier. This ramp is made up of a central ramp. <laughs> I don't know what else to call a ramp, where the sledge would have gone, and it was lined with a staircase that contained post holes. What's interesting is this ramp was an astonishing 20 degree angle, which shows that the Egyptians were really capable of hauling large stones over a steep angle, 20 degrees, that's a lot. We don't know what role the post holes played in that procedure yet, but no doubt more excavations will reveal that to us. So how many men were involved in the building of this pyramid? It's, it's really difficult to say. Clearly thousands just at the Giza site alone because they built an entire town to accommodate them. Considering modern man is roughly as strong as the average Egyptian man, 
we can have a good go at estimating how many men it took to haul these stones. To lay the two and a half million stone blocks over the 20 years, the Egyptians would have had to move roughly 340 stones per day. Experiments have shown 20 to 30 men could move a stone of two to three tons. Assuming they moved one kilometer an hour, they could do the 320 meter journey in 19 minutes. With a rest and a return journey, they could probably move one stone an hour, 10 stones a day. To move 340 stones a day would require 34 divisions of 20 men or 680 haulers. 10 stones a day is quite an ambitious target though. If they only moved 5 stones a day, to hit that production target would take 1400 men. Quite a lot, but not crazy, Egyptian civilization could certainly muster that much manpower easily. Despite all of this evidence and our best educated guesses, there are still questions that remain unanswered. And in my opinion, two of the biggest are, how did they build the top of the pyramid and how did they maintain the angle? As you got closer and closer to the top of the pyramid, no matter what ramp you had, whether it was straight or around the base or an interior, as you get closer to the top of the pyramid, your workspace becomes narrower and it just becomes much, much harder to build that ramp, maintain that ramp and work around it. So how the Egyptians did this, we really do not know. Likewise, we do not know how they kept and maintained such a nice steady angle all the way up the pyramid. We just do not know what kind of architectural and engineering techniques they used to keep that sighted in especially if they used a ramp that curved around the pyramid, it would be really hard to visualize and maintain that angle. So there you have it. That's the nuts and bolts of how the Egyptians might have built the pyramids. I've put a ton of research into this video. As I said, all the sources are in the description. Check them out. I am freezing my tits off here. So who knows if this is going to make the final cut. I'm absolutely getting buried in snow. So is my poor wife behind the camera. Check out the collaboration, in particular, the two people whose periods are closest to mine. History Time, he's talking about the Nordic Bronze Age, and Jack Rackham, who's talking about the life and times of Hammurabi. The worst Egypt location ever. You probably can't even hear me over the cars. See you guys. Take, let's go home. Okay. Just throw it in the car.